before we start, I just have some technical uh, advice for all the participants. I kindly invite everyone to keep their uh, microphones on mute uh, and their cameras off while we have the presentation. On the other hand, I will also invite you all to put the cameras uh, and the microphones on when we do the breakout sessions, because we want this also to be an opportunity for all of you to meet the other participants and also to have uh, the possibility of meeting the speakers. As having said that, uh, I will now give the floor to uh, Jackson, Jackson Howard from Euraxis uh, for a quick uh, introduction. Let me just add an information for everyone before. Uh, you will be using a polling system during the event. So just uh, while Jackson will mention something in the welcoming address, just take note of the above uh, link uh, on the screen. So menti.com, www.menti.com and use the code 53628660. So 53628660. And this will allow you to answer to some questions uh, in, the, in, in a few minutes and also to send your questions uh, to the speakers for the second part of the seminar. Jackson. Thank you so much, Paolo. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our attendees joining from all over the world. Uh, I'd also like to welcome you to our event, Science Diplomacy in the Post-COVID Era, Current Challenges and Future Prospects from the EU. Uh, in just a little bit, you'll hear from great speakers representing the European Union, the European Commission's active science diplomacy projects, and your access worldwide. Uh, as Paolo said, my name is Jackson Howard. I work for your access North America uh, my colleague will speak later and introduce more about your access. Uh, and then with that, I think it's appropriate if I formally introduce you, Paolo. Well, uh, well, so well, let me first introduce you because uh, uh, Jackson, Jackson, uh, we will play this game together of presenting our uh, fabulous speakers. So Jackson Howard is the regional representative for Euraxis North America. Uh, he's responsible for Canada and the US. His main role is to inform the community of researchers of all scientific domains and nationalities based in North America about the funding and career opportunities that the European research area offers. This includes uh, European, national and regional funding opportunities. Another important role is the management of the European scientific diasporas in North America, uh, in the North America Initiative, together with the European uh, EU delegation and the EU member states and associated countries. Prior to joining Euraxis, he worked in the diplomatic and nonprofit sectors. Thank you very much. I'm happy to return the favor here. So uh, today's moderator is Paolo Martinez, CPF uh, of FUTOR. Uh, you are a certified professional facilitator by the International Association of Facilitators, or IAF, uh, and an IAF Platinum Facilitation Impact Award winner. Uh, today's moderator, Paolo, has been facilitating complex open innovation and societal innovation projects for more than 20 years in 30 countries and four continents for international institutions such as the UN FAO, the European Commission, the EU Joint Research Center, the European Space Agency and several national and regional governments, as well as large and small private sector companies. So, so Paolo, if you could please introduce the format a little bit further, uh, we'll, we'll hear about how today's event's going to go and then we can, we can begin to hear from our speakers. Yes, yes. So the program uh, as a topic uh, is uh, relating to science diplomacy and uh, especially how science diplomacy is dealing with uh, uh, post-COVID, uh, hopefully very soon post, at the moment, still COVID era. And uh, we, we have uh, the following uh, uh, speakers. We have, uh, I will read one and you read the other. So we introduce them with different voices. 
We have uh, Mary Kavanagh, the Minister Councillor Research and Innovation of the Delegation of the Euro European Union to the United States. And in a few minutes, uh, Jackson will also introduce uh, Mary's bio. Then we have a breakout to meet one another after Mary's, then Jackson. And then uh, you'll hear from my colleague, the other half of Euraxis North America, Dr. Daria Buyuktanir Karajan, a researcher at the Elliott School of International Affairs uh, of George Washington University here in Washington, DC, and the program manager uh, at Euraxis North America. Then you will hear uh, Pierre Bruno Ruffini, the professor of international economics at the Faculty of International Affairs uh, and at the University of Le Havre. He's also the inside case study author and expert. It's one of the projects Pierre Bruno will be talking about. And then uh, finally, Dr. Mitchell Young, assistant professor, professor in the Department of European Studies at Charles University in Prague uh, and an Imperial Work Package Leader at S4D4C. After the roundtable discussion with our uh, panelists, we will then do another breakout session where you as participants have the possibility to anchor the insights and reflect on specific questions that you would like to pose to the uh, panelists. And uh, we will then uh, harvest your questions, get some Q&A and uh, go move into the conclusions. So Jackson, uh, would you like to, in to say why it's such an honor to have uh, Mary Kavanagh and tell us more about Mary before we give the floor to her. That will become quickly apparent. Uh, so as, as Paolo mentioned, Dr. Mary Kavanaugh is the Minister Counselor for Research and Innovation uh, at the European Union's delegation to the United States here in Washington, DC. Uh, her role involves raising awareness of EU-US cooperation, including opportunities for exchange and research and innovation at both government agency and stakeholder levels. Uh, prior to her current posting, she worked as the Deputy Head and Senior Expert in Managing Cooperation with North America, Latin America, and the Caribbean, uh, at the International Cooperation Directorate of the Directorate General for Research and Innovation at the European Union headquarters in Brussels. So Dr. Kavanaugh, thank you so much for being here with us today. Yes, uh, Mary, I will uh, ask you one first question to start opening the discussion as the topic is uh, science diplomacy. So uh, what are your thoughts, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh? on uh, the growing importance of science diplomacy, not only in regards to the ongoing pandemic, but as a key element in achieving the EU's broader goal of becoming a stronger global actor? Well, thank you for that uh, question. Um, I think that uh, diplomacy as a whole, meaning the, the activity of managing international relationships is, um, going to play a, obviously a very important role in general um, for uh, the Europeans vision of you know increasing its um, prominence as a, as a global research actor um, I think that in many of the areas where Europe is particularly um, going to be in the guidance and going forward for example in the area of um, uh, green technologies and the, the Green New Deal uh, climate research I think that um, the science and technology will be will be very key in those areas for sure and that's certainly something we will be looking at um, um, and we look forward very much to having a, as we have always had in the past a very open new framework program for research and innovation and um, to working with countries around the world using this tool of the um, of the framework program amongst others Uh, thank you. And uh, how do you help to create the bridges between the EU and the US? Uh, myself, in my, in my role, I'm the uh, Minister Councillor for Research and Innovation here in Washington, DC, where, by the way, it is snowing at the mm -hmm. moment. Very, very beautiful and very Christmassy. Um, so my role is, um, I, there are a number of activities that I do in order to try to um, um, encourage and, and, and build um, the relationship with the United States. 
Um, one is, of course, to raise awareness of the activities of, of the European Union and raise awareness of the opportunities that exist for cooperation through Horizon 2020. Uh, raise awareness, um, and we often work together with our Your Access colleagues on this, um, raise awareness of the um, opportunities that are available for individual researchers uh, who may, for example, wish to spend part of their research career in Europe or for institutions in the United States who may be interested to, um, um, to host European fellows who may wish to spend part of their research career here in the United States. So these are programs that we, we promote. Um, um, for example, the European Research Council um, um, grants and the um, Marie Curie Fellowships, um, which are funded through the current research program, which is Horizon 2020. So um, this is one aspect of what I do. Another aspect of what I do, other than raising awareness here in the United States, is raising awareness in Europe of what's happening policy-wise in the United States. So obviously a large part of my role is, is reporting um, on, on policy developments here in the United States. Um, we also um, organize events. Um, and um, well, back in the day when we when travel was possible, we, or, we organized a lot of visits for uh, people from the United, from, from Europe, um, high level um, uh, research policy makers who come to the United States to, um, to discuss with their counterparts here and think about ways that we can work together going forward. So that was another, another aspect of work of, um, uh, of my role, yes. I'll be happy to, uh, to jump in here, Paolo. I think we make a great team, including with your introductions earlier. Uh, so to, to briefly speak to one of the things Dr. Kavanaugh mentioned is that she informs uh, sort of um, other projects and, and initiatives of the European Commission, like your access uh, here to, to further uh, some of the, the work and aims of the EU delegation to the US. One of the things uh, that, that you minded us of or informed us of just a, just a week or two ago was a new joint EU-US, uh, I want to make sure I get the name exactly right here, uh, the new EU-US Agenda for Global Change. Uh, it's a nice brief document. I'll be happy to share this in the chat for people that are interested since it's a public document. Um, do you mind speaking to how science plays a role in this? Because I think it's, it's a very, it's a great general framework overarching uh, communication, but specifically from, from your perspective with research and innovation, how, how science plays a role there. Uh, yes, absolutely. The um, well, can I take a step back, Jackson? Can Please. I take a step back here because I'm I I I, I just want to to talk about 2020 as a whole and what has happened in 2020. So 2020 has been an extraordinary year. 2020 has seen um, it, it has brought us a lot of anxiety. It has brought us frustrations. It has brought us disappointments. But 2020 has also brought us a lot of hope. One of the main uh, things where uh, it has brought us hope is, funnily enough, in the area of COVID-19. Um, we have just started, we've just seen rolling out the first vaccines from, for, uh, for COVID-19, uh, both in the, um, in the United Kingdom and in the, in the United States, just in the last week or so. And what's really interesting is that this vaccine is a fantastic example of a transatlantic collaboration. Um, it is a, a vaccine in which the European Union has been very active in, in developing. It, um, the European Investment Bank, for example, um, funded the um, development of this vaccine and funded the, the, the company, the German company, BioNTech, which developed the technology um, with 100 million euros. Um, and this has been really, was really an important uh, contribution to the development of the vaccine. And of course, this company then partnered with Pfizer, a big um, US-based company, in a really great example of transatlantic partnership for um, working together to, to, to defeat this virus. So I think that's a very um, important example um, to, to mention. Um, the European Union has also, um, in, in addition to this, the, through Horizon 2020, we have invested 660 million euros so far in research on um, 
vaccine development, on therapeutics development, on testing, but also on medical systems in different countries, examining those to see how we can best um, defeat COVID-19 and save lives, but also with a view to future potential pandemics and outbreaks of infectious disease. So this is also a very important uh, role that the European Union has paid, played. But what's also important is that in all of this, we haven't done, I mean, obviously we're doing it for Europeans, but not only for Europeans, because we have been very um, aware of the um, important role that the EU European Union plays globally. And so the, um, um, back at the beginning of the summer, the, the European Union together with the WHO um, launched this global partnership um, on COVID-19. And that global partnership has so far raised pledges of 16 billion euros in, um, uh, for research and innovation on vaccines, on um, um, therapeutics and testing, but not only for the rich countries of the world, even though probably most of the pledges come from the rich countries of the world. But the idea was really that until everyone is safe, no one is safe. And so therefore, with a really strong um, intention to um, play a, 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 a crucial role in ensuring that these vaccines, therapeutics and tests aren't available only for rich countries, but also can be um, um, uh, spread in uh, countries around the world, which are perhaps developing countries or, or lower income countries um, through the COVAX um, initiative. So this is a very... Um, this is a very important role that the European Union has been playing globally. Um, so this is one thing for, for 2020 that I wanted to, to draw to your attention. The, the second thing is that um, um, 2020 also saw us developing our next framework program for research and innovation. And this framework program for research and innovation, perhaps some of, your, of, the, of our audience here today um, are familiar with the current framework program, which is called Horizon 2020. Um, the uh, European Union has had these what are called framework programs for research and innovation for many decades now um, and they're multi-annual programs. So Horizon 2020 will come to an end at the end of this year and we will start in 2021 with a new program which will be called Horizon Europe. It will be a seven-year program with a budget of a, um, about 95 uh, billion euros which is about 115 billion dollars at the moment and um, so this will be again our major tool for interacting at a european level internationally because it's also important to recall that this framework program for research and innovation is the tip of the iceberg of research funding in europe because of course we also have the um all of the european union member states have their own research and innovation um funding and their own uh, um, international activities, be they bilateral or multilateral around the world. But the framework program is the one instrument we have on a European level. So this is very important. So Horizon Europe, which will start uh, in the spring of 2021, will have many similarities to our current framework program. It will continue to fund collaborative research. It will continue to fund um, um, opportunities for for individual researchers, um, for example, through the European Research Council and the Marie Curie Fellowships. Um, and these, it's important to note, are because, because our programs are open to the world. So these opportunities um, for the grants of the ERC, for the fellowships of Marie Curie, are open to any researchers from anywhere in the world who would like to spend part of their research career in Europe. This is a very important element in building up um, not only research excellence in, um, in, in this brain circulation, but it's also very important, of course, in the most basic thing of diplomacy, which is um, getting countries and peoples to know one another a little bit better and to work together. There's no better way to do that than to work together. Um, likewise, the collaborative research opportunities that we offer will be available for researchers um, from anywhere in the world to collaborate with European researchers in Horizon Europe. Um, Horizon Europe will have one, uh, will have several novelties. I'd just like to draw your attention to one of those novelties, and that is particularly to the area of um, what we will call, what are called missions. Um, uh, these missions will be really global in scope. They will be 
really aiming to deal on a, uh, on a, on a large scale with um, major global problems that we have. But they won't be research for research. They will be absolutely expected to deliver and to have impact. Um, five areas have been identified for these, um, these missions. Um, one is on cancer and the others are all very closely related to one of the major European um, visions for uh, the future, which is um, called the European Green Deal, which is, is really a, a vision of Europe as a, a, a carbon neutral um, continent by 2050. But of course, we don't only want Europe to be the one that's carbon neutral. We obviously would, would like to, to move the whole world towards more carbon neutrality uh, going forward. And so therefore, these global missions, the other four, in addition to cancer, will be on um, uh, uh, climate adaptation, uh, on uh, clean and healthy soils and food, on um, uh, clean and smart cities, and on clean oceans, seas and waterways. So these are areas where we will expect and we, we hope to see a lot of, uh, of international interaction on, on many different levels um, in order to move these things forward and come up with really impactful um, discoveries and in draw your attention to in horizon in, in 2020 um is what you referred to jackson in your question sorry to take so long to come to it but i i i needed to give a bit of context so um in the um as i mentioned earlier our, our program will be uh, open to the world we we see that research and innovation is extremely important in um as as a as a support to every um, to our interactions with almost every country in the world, um, we um, see science as as really a key underpinning um, policy. In addition to being a policy on its own, um, so in uh, just at the beginning of this month, the European Union um, launched a, a, a published um, a new communication. Um, specifically uh, um, calling for a new partnership between the United States and Europe um, for global change. So there again, you see that we want to work very closely with, you know, what is together with Europe, Europe and the United States are the, are the, are the really the world's powerhouses of research and innovation. And working together, we can achieve so much um, to make this a better world for everybody. Um, so um, the, the communication calls in particular for cooperation in the areas of, of, of climate change, of um, global health, of um, um, it calls for um, a clean tech alliance. And all of these are areas where cooperation and research and innovation will play a really important role, of course, we expect. But it won't only be um, it, it won't only be science that will play an important role. It will be science playing an important role as part of, of a, a bigger um, a, approach, um, which I think is, is extremely important. Um, we shouldn't think of science as being something that's, um, in, at least in international relations, that's something that's, you know, its own self-serving thing. It's part of diplomacy. Um, and, the, um, and as such is, 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 is a, that's a very important feature, but it, it's not its own. It, it's not its own um, globe, shall we say? So, um, so that's a little bit to to your question about the um, about the the recent communication. But I should also say that, of course, we look very much forward, and I myself, particularly, since I'm, I'm obviously it's a large part of my job, will really look forward to to this cooperation with the United States. But of course, um, our cooperation. Um, goes um, it, it, it is, is our, our um, research and innovation cooperation um, is goes beyond only the United States. Um, we work, of course, together with the United States in a number of, of multilateral initiatives, which we hope we will see develop even more going forward. Uh, one of those being, for example, the um, mission innovation, specifically on clean energy technologies. Another on um, um, uh, or at um, the All Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance, where 
really we have very good cooperation but in a multilateral setting and we really do hope to develop these further going forward um, um, so we work with the United States but many other countries as well but in addition to that we also have a lot of bilateral co cooperation not only with the United States but also with um, um, countries that are closer neighbors also for example um, the, the Western Balkans the um, 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 our Mediterranean partner countries, the, the countries of, of the Mediterranean and, and the continent of Africa is a very big priority for uh, European Union in all areas of diplomacy and also in the area of research and innovation cooperation. But these are just some examples because of course we, for example, with, um, um, with Japan, um, our commissioner recently signed an agreement with Japan to work together on areas where we have a mutual um, interest, um, what the Japanese call their moonshots, and uh, we will work together with them um, with what we're doing in, in Horizon Europe in joint activities. So therefore, in conclusion, I would say that um, science is a very important part of our overall diplomatic um, presence in the world. Um, we believe that science has a has a, has a very strong um, role to play in, in achieving Europe's go, um, global um, goals, uh, including the goals that we have for ourselves. Um, and we will certainly, uh, in Horizon Europe, continue to work with partner countries around the world um, on, on not only on specific um, and bilateral or on specific um, area specific topics, but also on, on things like framework conditions, things that are very close to the heart of Europe, like, for example, um, um, open access for framework conditions, like, like open access to research results um, and to research data so that it's, um, it can be easily found and that it can be reused so that people can build on one another's work. Um, on things like research integrity, which I know is very important here in the United States, but also globally, um, on, on ethics, um, on IPR. So there are many areas where we have, you know, plenty of, um, of, of, of work on the table uh, going forward, where we really do look forward to, to working with, uh, with countries around the world. And in my case, um, and my colleagues, particularly um, with, the, with the United States. So that was a very long winded, um, intervention uh, Jackson but um, I hope that it uh, answers your question. I, I think it's a great overview and just to underscore how quickly moving a lot of the the timely news here is Mary uh, you spoke at an event of ours last week it was great but since then the first vaccine shipments have been made the, the first initial uh, administration of, of the shots themselves have been made so quickly on a day-to-day week-to-week basis the news is changing. Uh, furthermore as you mentioned with Horizon Europe uh, formally taking place the beginning of next month, uh, next year, the seven year program. Uh, it, it's hard to maybe give specifics about a lot of open calls right now. So I think in the coming weeks and months, a lot of this will become clear and we're, we're very happy to collaborate and, and join wherever the EU delegation goes virtually and eventually physically uh, across the US to give information sessions. So I would encourage anyone uh, in the audience in particular that's interested on, on calls and receiving funding and collaboration opportunities and research partnerships uh, just to continue to have your, your sites set on the EU delegation uh, in Washington, D.C., sign up for the, the email newsletters and follow them on social media because they will be very heavily promoting uh, the opening of the, of the program. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh. We really appreciate your remarks. And in fact, uh, one other um, thing happened since last week, not only the rollout of the vaccines, but also um, when, when we spoke last week, um, we didn't yet have a multi-annual uh, financial framework program in the European Union. And that was breaking news on Friday. We got a, we got the MFF, the multi-annual financial framework, which meant that we have a budget now for Horizon, um, for Horizon, mm -hmm. and so this is why we can uh, start to um, to do the next phases of the work to get um, Horizon Europe off the ground uh, er, as early as we can in 2021, and uh, hopefully we'll have the first calls um, in, in the spring. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary. And uh, you brought, as you said, uh, hope. And you also showed uh, clearly uh, how science diplomacy can be in action. So how the tools and the mechanisms that you were describing 
So I invite, as Jackson said, to stay tuned with the activities of Euraccess North America that's organizing this session and also to follow the next uh, uh, part of the seminar that will be bringing examples of projects that are dealing with science diplomacy issues as well as the activity of Euraccess. Before we move uh, to that session, I uh, invite everyone to do a quick speed dating exercise. You will be, um, you will be sent to a room uh, with someone else, just one person. So you will be in couples. And uh, I invite you to ask uh, the other person who, that, who, who she or he is, why she or he is attending this seminar, but you only have 60 seconds each. It's just to connect and to meet one another uh, for a few seconds. Then we move on with the activities. So uh, we do this for two rounds of a couple of minutes and uh, you will have to just accept the invitation that you It too, too short, too so we should only have these What's sessions it? instead of having long webinars, uh, a lot right. of uh, <laughs> rapid check-ins and check-outs. So um, what we do is uh, you have uh, just met someone else and we will make sure that you can keep uh, connecting also through the Euraccess platform. Um, we will just ask a few questions to the participants before opening the next uh, uh, the next part. So, uh, just to know more about who's in the room, what country are you from? So, if you have a, if you have a, a smartphone, you can just uh, write menti.com and code five three six two eight six zero. So we start getting. Uh, uh, a picture of who is participating to the se to the seminar. This is called a world cloud. So uh, the more a certain uh, uh, country or name is repeated, the bigger it gets compared to others. So I give you just a few seconds to uh, send to submit your answer, and you can see in real time. We have uh, someone from Mexico, US, uh, US, uh, uh, Germany, Italy, India. What I like here, Paolo, is that you've enabled multiple responses because sometimes it, there's yes. not a straightforward single single yeah, response yeah, here. Yeah. We are we are uh, already as you cannot be a scientist or a diplomat if you have not. Uh, at least uh, you're, you, you are in a different country, but coming from, from another one, so you have explored more places. Yes, we have Bhutan as well with us. And uh, the picture is changing under our eyes. Macedonia, Czechia, Austria, Sweden, Israel. Yes, Texas. So as you can see um, with this, uh, you can keep submitting your, your questions and we can also uh, start getting your uh, possible Q&A as uh, you will see later uh, directly from uh, the next part. So let's move to the next question. So here is uh, what sector are you in? Are you connecting from academia, government, industry, nonprofit? I have to say, this is the first time I've seen an event where we, we don't have a single other. Normally, it's really hard to capture in just a few categories. So, yeah. uh, interesting. And I, yeah. I'm getting a, a small number of chat messages just expressing interest in the sort of speed dating or, or small group networking format. So, as Paolo mentioned, I think um, I'll, I'll try to gauge interest in this further and see if this is something we can put together next year. Um, whether it's thematic or, or just general for, for all members, but this, I'm really happy to, to see if we can get people together to, to know each other a little bit further. So thank you. Continue to share your feedback. We'll, we'll uh, yeah, ask you the questionnaire at send the end. More, thank you. Uh, send more 
of your, yeah, we have a majority of participants are from academia. Then we have some people from government. I don't think everyone has submitted their answer. So let's now move to the next question. And you know, the topic today is uh, science diplomacy. And uh, I'm going to ask, uh, what is your opinion? You can uh, say you strongly agree or you totally disagree. And uh, the question is, uh, I consider myself a science diplomat, or I am totally aware of what science diplomacy is. And here you can see the distribution of the votes as they arrive and the curve of uh, uh, whatever uh, one believes. So if one is totally aware of science, what science diplomacy is about, or if someone believes uh, uh, directly or indirectly that she or he is a science diplomat. So yeah, as votes are coming in, the, we are on the average. It's interesting to see However, that the curve is uh, uh, more towards knowing uh, that what a science diplomacy is than not. And uh, the last question that we keep open, and at the moment we received one, but we will answer the questions at the end. Um, you can submit all the time questions as you hear the next speakers. So you just have to add surname of the speaker and the question. And uh, you can also see from your mobile phone what questions have arrived and you can uh, upvote them so that we can then answer to the ones that receive most uh, results. So let's uh, have a look. Who are the next, uh, our next uh, panelists? And uh, let's uh, briefly describe uh, the bios and why it's such an honor to have them with us, uh, Jackson. Yeah, so uh, I'll jump into the bios for everyone since we'll sort of uh, do more of a roundtable format, as you mentioned. So uh, first, I'll introduce my colleague, Dr. Daria Boutinier Karajan. She is the project manager for Your Access North America. She received her PhD in economics and international relations. Uh, and after her PhD, she continued her studies at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. She's also taught courses in as an assistant professor in Turkey. And besides her academic credentials, she has 13 years experience on different national and international development projects supported by the European Commission and the World Bank. Uh, currently, Daria is a visiting researcher at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. Uh, and then after that, we have uh, Dr. Pierre Bruno Ruffini, who is Professor of International Economics at the University of Le Havre Normandy in France. He formerly served as the Science and Technology Counselor at the French, uh, at the French embassies uh, in Russia and Italy. I'll ask for any corrections there if I, if I may be misreading this. Um, Pierre Bruno also acts as an expert in the Horizon 2020 ongoing uh, research project, Inventing a Shared Science Diplomacy in Europe, which he may speak to briefly. Uh, and then finally, Dr. Mitchell Young is an assistant professor in the Department of European Studies at the Charles University in Prague. He is an expert in EU knowledge, governance, and science policies. Uh, Mitchell is also a work package leader, as I mentioned earlier, for the Horizon 2020 project, using science for slash in diplomacy for addressing global challenges. Uh, he's the chair of the ECPR standing group on knowledge, politics, and policies, uh, and he holds a PhD from Charles University. So thank you to the, the three speakers we have next. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. The, the first uh, question, uh, and you know, as we had uh, uh, Dr. Mary Kavanagh introducing the overall policies of the EU and the US North America, I'm going to ask uh, Daria, uh, Daria to talk uh, a bit about the EUR access worldwide. I have uh, looked up on the website and Euraxis is not having just an office in North America covering uh, Canada and US. It also has uh, the ASEAN area, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, a China and India office, a Japan, a Korea, and of course the North America one that is hosting this event. So, um, Daria, 
what is your access worldwide about and how do you position yourself in the European science diplomacy ecosystem? Thank you, Paolo. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I want to say hi uh, from a very beautiful and slow day in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, I also want to say welcome on behalf of Euro Access Worldwide. And it's the first time uh, that we mention Euro Access role or, or uh, new, uh, yes, no role in uh, the EU science diplomacy. So I want to start with the pandemic and why it's becoming more important um, uh, our missions and roles. So uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, showed us again the prominence of networks of scientists and scientific diasporas, research partnerships and the collaborations among different nations. And with the very specific example of developing a vaccine, we have seen that cooperation and collaboration on science and technology have gained more importance. And moreover, scientists and their networks have emerged as the crucial agents of main, uh, change for most of the countries in managing pandemic and safeguarding public uh, health. Under these unique circumstances, networks of scientists and organizations supporting these networks are assuming high responsibilities. So EuroAccess Worldwide is one of these organizations. So it is the international arm of EuroAccess. And EuroAccess launched 17 years ago, and it was formerly known as ERAMOR. ERA means European Research Area. And the overall aim is to support researcher mobility and career development while enhancing scientific collaboration between Europe and the world. So EuroAccess Worldwide offers uh, to interact on a global scale. It is a pan-European initiative and a networking tool uh, supporting researchers working outside of Europe who wish to connect or stay connected with Europe. And it has dedicated eight uh, hubs, as you mentioned. Um, and uh, in uh, China, India, Japan, Korea, North America, Australia, and New Zealand, and ASEAN. And through its information portal, it provides free information on career opportunities, fellowships, and funding programs available to researchers anywhere in the world who wish to conduct research in or by collaborating with Europe. So EuroAccess Worldwide acts as information brokers or facilitators. It is a tool for guiding events. Best example, it provides best, best examples around the world. And more importantly, it promotes ERA, European Research Area, and the services of EuroAccess initiative. And also, as Mary explained, the details of Horizon 20 and 2020 and Horizon Europe, uh, EuroAccess Worldwide promotes uh, uh, these framework programs from the angle of mobility, especially from the Mercury and ERC, European Research Council grants. So it develops and animates a network of researchers in partner countries. So before I mention the EuroAccess Worldwide's role in the EU science diplomacy solution, I just want to share a broader context on the EU's growing emphasis on science and technology co in innovation cooperation with different countries and regions, which is also related to Euro access missions. <clears throat> so the current president of European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, in the Agenda for Europe, uh, states that Europe must lead the transition to a healthy planet and a new digital world, but it can also do so by bringing people uh, together at upgrading our unique social market economy to fit today's new ambition. It gives a very big general picture. And before uh, uh, that, the former commissioner, Carlos Moedas, uh, had a strategic uh, approach for open science, open innovation, and open to the world. But the insights of Maria Gabriel, the current commissioner for innovation, research, culture, education, and youth, are very important, her insights, and very current and timely, because 
she uh, her long term goal is the launch of a European knowledge strategy. It has a broader strategy and it tries to combine not only uh, integration or uh, I mean it, it's not only about era also they want to uh, include European education area as well so uh, uh, also in her uh, very recent article towards science diplomacy in the European Union she states that science and technology uh, by its nature international and brings cooperation among different actors she mentions three points, which can be also related to the Euro Access Worldwide aims. These are promoting international uh, interdisciplinary research and joining forces and working together through joint research. So I can also mention uh, many other position papers, but I just want to share the very recent ones. The first policy, uh, position paper is the uh, policy paper is the new era communication it's published at the end of september this year and the, in that paper uh, the eu aims at deepening era and makes uh, more emphasis on promoting cross-border collaboration and connecting across uh, actors across borders so your access has the potential for helping the deepening of european research area as it is stated under the need of a toolbox built on tackling the recognition of researcher skills and also one stop shop portal that your, uh, researchers can access for a number of services. Another uh, recent uh, position paper <coughs> issued by Air Communication Work Related Group on Science Diplomacy, uh, it provides a broader perspective on policy making and among many other messages. Science diplomacy is mentioned as one of the effective tools for the EU to strengthen its role as a global actor. And more importantly, and related to us, strengthening support to scientist networks outside Europe is perceived as one of the keys. So in another position paper prepared by uh, Scientific Forum for International Cooperation, uh, science diplomacy aspects of Horizon Europe is uh, in that paper. Horizon Europe is acknowledged, and Horizon Europe itself revealed in this paper as is a science diplomacy tool through offering an open, transparent, and globally relevant relevant program which benefits go beyond Europe. So within this very general, very fast uh, uh, explanation. Your access can be considered as one of the stakeholders with the EU's science diplomacy ecosystem. Uh, your access worldwide has been operating as a part of practice, practical operational side of new European research area uh, since it's the international arm of your access linking era to the rest of the world. So uh, this uh, position, I mean, the your access role as stakeholder also mentioned in some of the uh, uh, documents like S4D4C's training models that perhaps Mitchell is going to mention. So there you can see your access as your access worldwide can be a fundamental tool for European science diplomacy. So your access is just one of the stakeholders for science diplomacy. We have more. Uh, so I think also the European Union needs more actors and stakeholders to be uh, involved in this new area, which is really gaining more importance. Thank you very much, uh, Daria. So you, you, you basically described one of the main uh, stakeholders and tools uh, that uh, yes. your access can represent, not only for North America, but worldwide. Uh, to deepen the effect of the activities done uh, by in the European research area. And, uh, and uh, so it's a very much an, an important tool for science diplomacy. But uh, we saw from uh, the question that was shown before that not everyone maybe knows clearly what science diplomacy. So can I just ask, uh, you know, in a nutshell, Maybe I can uh, I can pass this question to Pier Bruno or to 
uh, Mitchell, uh, what, in a nutshell, what is a, why is it important? Uh, we heard uh, why, but maybe what it is? Uh, what is what is it? If so, if I had to explain it to my, uh, you know, to someone who is not a, 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 as a, an expert and a scholar and a practitioner like, like you are, what is it and why it's important? Okay, I, I will just a couple of words on this. First of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to join this uh, discussion. Um, well, I, I was uh, interested, you know, to, to, to notice that the two persons that you I could meet with the speed dating um, moments just before, the two of them uh, are students making a PhD on science diplomacy. So it's a fashion, it's, you know, there's an increasing interest in science diplomacy. So what is it about? Um, we didn't speak uh, of science diplomacy uh, before. It, it dates back to 10 or 12 years ago. And uh, in a nutshell, well, um, we um, look at uh, practices, at tools, uh, which are at the intersection of science and of, uh, of foreign policy, you see, foreign policy. I could add this. Um, when the concept emerged as a new uh, concept, as a new vocabulary, um, a very a strong emphasis was put on, on the global challenges. And still, um, many people, you know, think that um, science diplomacy is um, first and foremost um, a methodology to address global challenges, which it is, obviously, absolutely. But at the same time, we shouldn't forget that when we speak about diplomacy, you see, we speak about um, countries um, defending and promoting their interest on the global scene through the dialogue, of course. And we shouldn't forget that in science diplomacy, um, diplomacy means that country might have um, will to advance their uh, national interests. So science diplomacy is a mix, try to find um, a combination of addressing global challenges with the help of scientific input, of course, and at the same time for countries uh, trying to advance their national needs and interests, uh, and sometimes to take advantage of their orders. So managing the tensions between national interests and common interests on topics where the scientific input is important, it seems to me that we could uh, define science diplomacy in that way. Thank you. Uh, Mitchell, would you add to this uh, summary of Pier Bruno and uh, maybe tell us uh, who are some of the uh, actors uh, that are part of this uh, uh, foreign policy and science uh, matching, uh, addressing the global challenges uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, carrying their own uh, uh, national interests with them? Absolutely. I mean, thanks as, as well uh, for having me here on this on this uh, webinar. Uh, well, I think I agree completely with with the definition uh, that Pierre Bruno has put forward. And, and on the same uh, hand, it's it's not a very satisfying definition. And, and unfortunately, I think it's kind of the best definition that we have is just this intersection of science and, and international relations. Uh, but there's a lot of things that fall under that, and there's a typology that that probably all of you who have any sort of exposure to science diplomacy know about, uh, the science for and in diplomacy, as well as diplomacy for science, and I'm not going to talk about that because probably those that know it already are very tired of hearing about it. But this also sort of invites a lot, I think, of open questions. and. Um, what we've been doing in our project, and we had this sort of broad set of case studies where we were trying to capture a lot of examples and types of science diplomacy that maybe were not labeled as such. Um, and so what we've tried to do in the project is to bring out this idea that a lot of science diplomacy is implicit. Um, and that comes both in terms of the actors of science diplomacy as well as in the practices of science diplomacy. And, and so what we mean by this is that there's, there's many reasons that things don't get labeled, let's say, as science diplomacy. Um, 
And so I think part of these questions that came up at the beginning, it was interesting for me to see that uh, about half of you um, in the, in the uh, sort of registration question didn't answer this, I am a science diplomat uh, question. And then here we have this very mixed uh, response in, in the Mentimeter. But I think this is exactly right and this is typical because we can think about the science diplomat, the, the person with this in their title. Uh, this is the person, right, that, that has the responsibility to conduct diplomacy for science generally. Um, and it's a very specific uh, understanding of what science diplomacy is, what a science diplomat is. But there's a much broader uh, definition of this, which includes really all the scientists that are working at the intersection of foreign policy, that are trying somehow to, to interfere with foreign policy or to promote some sort of uh, foreign policy. And maybe I'll just throw out an example here because we're supposed to a little bit talk about COVID. Um, and there was, um, I think when we talk about COVID, there's sort of a tendency to think um, that all of it is, is science diplomacy. And I think that's not true. Um, I think that there's health diplomacy, which is slightly different than science diplomacy. Um, and I think there's a tremendous amount of of science in policy or science in diplomacy, where we see sort of science affecting policy making or science advising, and this is obviously crucial to, uh, to, to the COVID crisis. But I think the other thing that we see is there are examples of what we would call um, science for diplomacy, scientists trying to make a diplomatic effect, trying to have a, a, an impact on international affairs. And I'll just give one example which came up in, in March of this year, there was an open letter from the Italian scientists uh, to the scientists of the world, but really very much targeted at the British scientists, because this was at the time that Britain was saying, we are going to go for a herd immunity. And this was a letter of the Italian scientist to say, please essentially don't do this, um, and, and trying to explain what they knew at that point, which was very little about, about this uh, disease. And basically they called on the British scientists and scientists around the world to go to your government and to tell them, we need to contain this. We need to, we need to go with this containment narrative for how we address uh, COVID-19. So, so, so the main actors are the people working, uh, the scientists working at the intersection uh, between uh, foreign policy and science, uh, and uh, in in that sense, uh, uh, what have been? Uh, I, I'm going to ask this now to uh, Pier Bruno. Uh, you, 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 Pier Bruno, are also managing uh, a project. Uh, uh, the INSIDE project. It's, uh, it's a kind of acronym uh, that sounds like INSIDE. And uh, how is the project? Uh, it's funded by the European Union Horizon 2020 pro program. What, what is the scope uh, and uh, how is it uh, addressing uh, the, the principles of science diplomacy at this uh, current time of the COVID era? Yes, um, well, I'm not managing the project. I'm, I'm just one among the many that will work on this, uh, on this project. Well, this is a, a research project uh, which gathers uh, some 15 partners uh, coming from 10 different countries um, and, and adding to this uh, UNESCO as well, and which is coordinated uh, at the Sorbonne University by uh, Professor Pascal Griset. So uh, this project, in this project, we have two, uh, I would say three maybe uh, goals uh, to try to fulfill. Uh, first is to create new knowledge on past and present science diplomacy in Europe. And the project uh, considered that uh, science diplomacy has a strong uh, backbone in history. That means that um, not all, but many of the studies that we undertake uh, under this project are, um, are undertaken through a historical perspective. Uh, more specifically, we, um, we address um, science diplomacy in relation to five uh, areas. One is uh, heritage, another is uh, health, and then we find the COVID discussions. 
security environment and space so we have some experts specialists um, trying to investigate um, from a historical perspective um, each of those uh, sectors um, and, uh, adding to this uh, we have uh, two transversal research trends um, one is uh, looking at power power as a, a theoretical corpus uh, in order to 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 map uh, science diplomacy and to try to reconstruct all our observations under uh, theory of power and another one is more practical is looking at the practices of science diplomacy and it is dedicated to science diplomat as such the second goal is to uh, share the lessons we learn from the projects uh, to try to produce some uh, uh, policy reflection as well to disseminate the learning so uh, for this we organize events um, webinars um, workshops and so and we organized um, a few months ago a summer school uh, uh, for for this and then the third and last goal is to produce uh, written documents uh, academic papers but not only policy documents and training tools as well and more specifically we uh, plan to write 20 or so case studies um, the last one uh, which was issued is about implication and significance of framing a research reactor as a diplomatic object in the 70s of last century in morocco you see that it is a histor historical topic but myself for instance i am um, finishing writing um, a case study about the European science diplomats, the one working at the delegation and in the frame of this uh, research, I had the, the privilege to, to interview Dr. Marie Cavanagh. So that's, um, that's it's all about our uh, research project. Thank you, Pierre Bruno. So it's covering the history, it's covering already some specific areas and topics, uh, your project. Exactly. And, uh, and when, is the, when is it going to, uh, to be finished? Uh, I mean, to well, have results and information? Uh, we, we still have uh, one hour, uh, one year to go. One year to go uh, okay. to finish. Okay. And we work closely in relationship with the other project, you know, the one uh, which is uh, represented here by Mitchell Young and Sidney. Yes, so I'm also going to ask Mitchell to say, he introduced it, but just a few words, because I'd like to keep uh, also to talk specifically about the topic of COVID. But uh, Mitchell, say, uh, tell us more about your project. It has, uh, and we will be sharing uh, with the link and also to all the participants, they can get the connection to the website so that they can also know your activities of the of the projects that uh, inside and uh, s4d4c um so did i pronounce it well Mitchell? yes yes that's exactly how we say it s4d4c um so yeah this is one of the uh, sister projects with inside uh, both of them were funded in 2017 as part of a, a horizon 2020 call and I think it's it's interesting to see that that um, you know as as uh, Pierre Bruno was saying earlier that uh, science diplomacy has certainly become a very popular thing and, and the EU uh, very much sees it as a way to sort of uh, mobilize some I think of its its knowledge power. Um, but the the um, the call calls for two things and and so our project has two different uh, aspects to it. Um, we have an academic side and, and we have within that nine case studies that we're looking at. Uh, but then there's also a, a more practical side um, that's being addressed in the project. So not only do we have the case studies and, and conceptual framework work packages, we also have a, a set of training modules that's now been turned into one of these MOOC courses, uh, which is freely available online. So you can find the links on our website, but uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more about science diplomacy, there are seven uh, units uh, to that. There's also a, a webinar tomorrow talking about uh, the case studies in that in more detail. Um, so that's, that's one of the major things that we're trying to do is to 
move forward the training of science diplomats, and that's both from the diplomatic side, in other words, people who are diplomats who want to do science diplomacy, but also scientists who would like to somehow engage with uh, international affairs and, and foreign relations. Um, let me just mention briefly the casework that we're doing, um, and because we try to approach it from three different perspectives. Uh, we, we chose three cases in each of three areas, and these were sort of uh, based on what we saw as kind of the primary drivers, uh, whether it was foreign policy driven, where we tried to choose cases where the foreign policy relevance was strong um, and the science was more in a supporting role. So we looked at infectious diseases, which we'll come back to, I think, because that's obviously quite important for COVID, uh, water management and cybersecurity. And then we looked at cases where we thought the science was driving things. In other words, where the science was kind of pushing uh, maybe uh, foreign policy to, to behave a little differently. So in that one, we looked at uh, funding mechanisms for food security. We looked at large scale research investments, the FET flagships, and we looked at the open science movement. And again, I, I wanna come back to that one a little bit when we talk about COVID. And then lastly, we had this, this third pillar, which looked at infrastructures uh, and institutions of science diplomacy. And for that, we chose the Sesame infrastructure in, in, uh, in Jordan, uh, joint research programming, uh, and as well, science advising mechanisms in the area of fisheries. So that, that gives you a sense, and, and there's, there's a tremendous amount on the website, so I guess you'll, you'll share that and people can see it in more detail. Thank you for that. And uh, just uh, as we start uh, wrapping up this, uh, uh, I have a, a question about uh, what have been uh, for the lessons learned for science uh, diplomacy with the COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, pandemic crisis. Uh, maybe Pierre Bruno, would you like to share yes, your, um, your opinion on this? Well, I can, uh, yes. Um, first, first of all, I, it seems to me that uh, the COVID uh, situation uh, is a strong case of science diplomacy. Uh, this is a strong case. Why? Because um, there is obviously a, a major input in, of science, which is required to understand the pandemics, the origin of the virus, uh, the, its impact, and so on. So um, there is uh, there are scientific uh, uncertainties uh, still to be uh, to be removed, and there is so a uh, high input of science in, in the understanding of all of this and also in the making of the, the policies, of course. Then uh, the, the pandemics has a global dimension. Uh, this is a global threat, and uh, normally a global threat, a global challenge would uh, need uh, global responses. And uh, then um, I have, um, I, I, there is a sort of paradox. Uh, I have a mixed view on the, on uh, the COVID-19 seen from the perspective of sound diplomacy. Because it seems to me that uh, the COVID-19 uh, is typically uh, a situation in which sound diplomacy should have its greatest relevance. I mentioned before that sound diplomacy, the idea was born in, in the modern uh, sense uh, in, in connection with global challenges. So science diplomacy uh, would be uh, or should be the answer. And, uh, but so far, and this is where lies the paradox uh, maybe, so far science diplomacy uh, didn't meet um, such expectations. So uh, uh, my view is that um, if we want to understand uh, the COVID-19 uh, from the science diplomacy perspective, we have to uh, move a little bit deeper uh, in making a distinction uh, on what scientists can put uh, on the table, knowing that in the end, politicians have to decide uh, of it, you see. And um, the COVID-19 shows that maybe when science diplomacy doesn't work that well, I can explain why it, it doesn't work that well so far. Uh, when science diplomacy do doesn't meet expectations, um, Probably it's not because of science, and this is more uh, 
more importantly because of uh, conflicting national interests, uh, because of policy decisions, or political decisions. Uh, I don't want to be too long. I could, I could of course, develop this. Uh, but um, in a nutshell, I would say that um, what we have seen in the COVID-19 is a good international uh, scientific cooperation, transnational cooperation. Uh, Mary Kevin recalled that uh, uh, on the example of vaccine. Uh, what we have seen also is that um, the international community was not able to produce uh, global answers, I mean, uh, multilateral answers to the um, situation. It was more than uh, in the first half of this year, more my country first, you see. That's the second point. And then third thing, we uh, have now entered a, a different phase of uh, science diplomacy uh, of the coronavirus, which is the vaccine race. And in the vaccine race, probably um, there is of course cooperation, which is necessary, uh, which is um, uh, at work. But there is also a lot of competition, a lot of geostrategical uh, um, ingredients, uh, you know. And this is why uh, my, uh, my view about this is mixed, you know, because most people uh, have the idea that science diplomacy uh, should be uh, a solution. And so far, it hasn't proved to be the right solution. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, so it's, it's, uh, I wanted to ask you why, and you started to uh, answer to, to the why, of course, and we can, we can see why this is so, so, so relevant for the future, because, uh, yeah, there are interests uh, at stake now, there is the race, and uh, uh, Mitchell, you, 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 you play a lot on the topic uh, in, in one of your papers I was reading about the importance. I mean, how I was thinking somehow it's like the yin and yang, you know, uh, uh, it's like Eastern, you have to uh, balance the competition and the comparison, the disclosure, because science by its nature should be, you know, about sharing and at the same time, so can, can you chime in on that, uh, connected to what uh, Pier Bruno was saying? Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think that we have to understand in both of these uh, fields, in, in both science um, and in, in diplomacy, this dynamic of cooperation and competition happening together and simultaneously is, is natural to both of these fields. Um, you know, as, as scientists, those of you who are here as scientists, we know that we're, we're cooperating and competing all the time. And, and this is also happening, I think, in the diplomatic sphere. And I think this is one of the things to, to keep in mind that I think that we tend, when we look at the other sphere, so when we look from a scientist perspective at diplomacy, we tend to simplify what diplomacy is about. And I think the other way around is true too. When, when uh, diplomats look at science, uh, they tend to see it as a bit more simple, as a bit more clear than, than sometimes it is. Um, and in fact, this is an interesting discussion that we've had uh, in, in some interviews uh, with people about who makes uh, sort of an ideal person to present uh, science. And, and uh, what we've heard is, well, it's not the scientists because the scientists tend to say, you know, on the one hand this, but on the other hand that, or yes, we're, we're 75% sure of something, but, but not this clear black and white type of uh, information that, that the diplomats would like. And, and of course it goes the other way. Uh, you know, scientists see uh, some sort of information and, and we seem to think that, uh, well, we can just enact that politically um, because the science says that this is, this is what the right thing to do is. And then there's all kinds of more complicated political um, consultations and, and, and thoughts that need to go into it. I think this is the issue. Uh, we haven't talked about values right now, but when we talk about, let's say, the value of privacy, it seems to me that this is a very difficult issue when we're talking about COVID. Um, and, and if we look at the 
sort of European tracking and tracing mechanisms, these have been very much controlled by the, 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 the need to maintain GDPR standards, the need to maintain privacy. And yet we know that companies like, like Google could probably do the tracking and tracing for us without us having to do anything on top. They have that information. Um, following us through our mobile phone. So I think there's some really uh, difficult issues there. And, and to sort of build a little bit on what um, was, was said earlier, when we think about um, science diplomacy, one of the things that I think we think about is how do we get science values into the diplomatic sphere? I mean, can we build some sort of diplomacy on, on scientific values? And when I say that, I, I think about you know, things like openness, things like uh, Merton's norms of disinterestedness. Um, uh, and, and how do we sort of try to build linkages uh, by using those values as opposed to political values? Because what we see right now, I think, if, if we want to talk for a minute about the failures of, of science diplomacy or, or the failures of COVID is what we see is science has become politicized in many ways. Masks have become politicized. Why is this? This is not because of the science. This is, this is the politics sort of taking over the, the situation. And so um, how do we move away? I think we can see that the politicization of these things is in fact a sign of the failure of, of, of science diplomacy efforts. But maybe like not to end on uh, this sort of little comment on a negative note, I think What's remarkable, and, and I think this is what uh, Mary Kavanaugh was saying at the beginning, is the unbelievable mobilization of scientific effort uh, is incredible. I mean, there are, by some counts, 150,000 articles on COVID. There's just this massive amount. Now, some of these are not good research, uh, and, and there's problems and there's issues with, with some of this but other things uh, are, are very much, and we started with absolutely nothing. And I think that uh, just the last point here is that what's so interesting is that almost all of this is open access. And, and I just wanna to point to one thing in, in that regard, which is that this was not by accident. This was because after, after the Zika, after Ebola, after MERS, there was a recognition that in these types of situations, we needed open access. And there was a pre-set agreement among many of the major publishers, about 30 of them signed on to agree that they would publish open access if such a circumstance came up again. And what we saw was basically a frictionless shift into open access publishing. And then we saw a, a, a sort of spillover effect where almost everyone started to publish what was relevant to, open, uh, to COVID as open access. So I think this is, is a marvelous example of, of preparedness. It's one of the few examples of preparedness of COVID when we weren't sort of ad hoc, uh, ad libbing what we were doing, but we had a plan and we stuck to it and it really uh, worked very successfully. Thank you, Mitchell. I, I would have another 25,000 <laughs> questions for you all because it's such an inspiring, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's such a crucial topic at the moment. We are talking about uh, things that are affecting millions of people and how to deal with the governance of such a process of matching research and the foreign policy. And reflecting on what you are saying sometimes i feel that the problem of the relation between science and uh, uh, science and policy making is not just diplomatic but it also occurs within countries where at the moment we have the discussion about you know closing or not closing and do you listen to the experts about uh, having a lockdown or not uh, because uh, the match is between, you know, is the economy coming first or uh, is the society coming first? And uh, I think uh, the topic uh, for, this is my perception, uh, of course, the topic of science and policy making requires uh, much work to be done because you need uh, to make politicians understand better the science the policymakers and vice versa. And uh, 
having said that, just one closing remark because uh, I, we are giving more time to this session from one each one of you just as a message of hope like the one that uh, Mary was giving at the beginning, uh, Mary Covenant, uh, for the future of what can be the next steps with science diplomacy. Just a quick uh, one minute remark from uh, Pierre Bruno, Mitchell and Daria. Well, um, I don't want to cool down the enthusiasm, enthusiasm about, about science diplomacy, of course. I would say that the COVID-19, you know, is a so specific uh, uh, and tremendous uh, situation that, of course, it's not that surprising that countries, government, and even the scientific community, of course, uh, should be a little bit, a little bit uh, stressed by this and couldn't find immediately the right behavior, the right answers. Uh, I, I would just echo what uh, Dr. Kevin has said at the beginning. Um, of course, there, so far there hasn't been a global response to this global challenge. Uh, but there has been a European response, I mean a regional response at, at the scale of the European Union, you see. And that's encouraging. That means that when countries have some good, you know, political relationship, when they share um, common goals, but it's, of course it's much easier to try to find uh, solutions, uh, funding research, uh, supporting the economy, and, 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 and other different, you know, actions that uh, the, um, pre-ordering vaccines and so and so, uh, done at the level of the European Union. So that's that's encouraging, you know. Uh, teaming up is a good thing, and once again, this proves that when science diplomacy doesn't work, it's more because of the political um, uh, misconceptions of governments or. Um, political will to do uh, on, on, on its own way than because of science. That's uh, the European uh, example shows this um, perfectly, it seems to me. Thank you, Pierre Bruno. So we have examples uh, of collaboration, but not on the global scale, uh, but at the regional European scale and that's a sign of hope. And uh, yes, uh, Daria, you want to, what's your hope, uh, message of hope relating also from your access worldwide and your access? Yes, as your access, uh, we really try to engage more with the scientists uh, networks and the science, European scientific diasporas, which are really one of the most, I mean, has become one of the uh, most important agents for the countries, uh, especially for the, the Europe. And uh, the uh, pandemic is, uh, has really changed everything during this one year time. And so we are learning very hard and very quickly, unfortunately. And uh, the um, researchers are affected from these uh, unique circumstances. So uh, for the EU, I think um, we need to uh, perhaps, uh, as your access, we need to show the importance of establishing support mechanisms for the researchers, exchanging best practices and promoting the dissemination of evidence-based data. This is one of the things that we, I mean, I come uh, to this solution because we need scientists more uh, in the policy making. And uh, we need to create more networks, not only under these uh, unexpected circumstances, also for the post-COVID era, uh, because they are going to be more important for the future of also Europe, also for the other countries as well. Because when we look at the, the, for example, scientific diaspora networks, they're also the soft powers of the countries. So how we are going to connect them, how will we involve more scientists in policy making? This is the thing that, because the beginning of the pandemic, we were all discussing so many different topics. But when we uh, come to this point today, we all agree that cooperation is perhaps more important than uh, uh, competition, especially under these global challenges. 
So we need more scientific advice. We need more involvement of the scientists, perhaps uh, both under these global challenges as well as after post-COVID era, I think. So scientific, scientists perhaps need to be more involved in also policy making, not only for the EU, also for the other developed and underdeveloped, less developed countries. Thank you, thank you. Of course, this uh, uh, has to uh, also be agreed by the policymakers, as Pierre Bruno was pointing out, that sometimes uh, it's not the scientists that don't want to collaborate, but they have to be supported also by the policymakers in this process. And yes. Mitchell, Paolo, just one, yeah, please. Paolo, be before Mitchell, I also want to add something more. Uh, as Euraxis, I mean, Euraxis is only one stakeholder in EU science diplomacy. We have another actors, diplomats, scientists. But the thing is that what we do is we need to also support the EU's policies by giving really, I mean, real information from the ground, from the scientists. Because policymakers, politicians, diplomats need that kind of information coming directly from the ground, from the scientists to decide correctly and timely. So these are very important in terms of not only for us, I mean, for your access, because for example, we made a, a large scale um, survey on researchers mobility. And it's just an example of giving a feedback for the policymakers of the EU for their future decisions. Because if they don't take this kind of data from us or from other stakeholders, how they are going to decide. So this is also important in terms of, you know, policymakers. Thank you. Thank you. What we'll do next time is not to have a session of one and a half hours, but two and a half hours or three hours, because <laughs> there's so much we can say, and time is almost up. Uh, we will have uh, uh, now with, uh, jo <laughs> with Mitchell, the closing uh, uh, wrap up and then, uh, go back to the plenary and the breakout. But uh, Mitchell, yes, you heard lots of ideas and what, are, what are, is your message of hope? Yeah, I, I think my message of, of hope is, is just that when we look at COVID, uh, we see how much uh, science can do and how much we can accomplish if we, if we sort of set ourselves a, a concrete goal like this and we put the sort of resources into it that are necessary. And I think very often when we, when we look at policy and, and, and policy making, and this is true certainly in the EU, there's a fear of, of wasting money by doing things twice or, or having things multiple. I mean, right now we have around the world, what, 150 uh, attempts to create a vaccine. That may be more than we need to do for many things, but we certainly shouldn't be putting all our eggs in one basket when we're looking at these big problems. We really need to be doing this in, in multiples, in parallels. And I think that's a lesson that we can take uh, away. And I think the second thing that's really important is that COVID has shown not only the importance of, of medical and STEM sciences, but also the social sciences and humanities and how important they were, in, in particularly in the early stages of this uh, crisis in at least giving us some tools to work with and some information to work with and, and some way to make sense of, of what was happening to us. Um, so I, I do see as well that there's a tremendous amount of hope and there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for science diplomacy uh, moving forward. Thank you, thank you. And of course, uh, uh, as the missions that were mentioned by Mary Kavana. Uh, the ones on cancer, the Green Deal, the climate, uh, those are also areas where uh, we can work through science diplomacy to have a much bigger impact and avoid uh, uh, redundancy or, uh, you know, as you said, there can be some redundancy, but uh, maybe there is a limit uh, because that's also becomes wasteful in terms of activity. So coordinating uh, such efforts would be certainly good uh, for, for society. So uh, I really want to thank you all. And I'm not saying this uh, because I, 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 I'm really enjoying uh, all the things that you are sharing. And it, it, I feel uh, really sad to interrupt 
our conversation, but I really want to thank uh, the, the three of you. Uh, and as we would like to thank also Mary Kavana before. And now I invite everyone, we have uh, the, the following program. Uh, time's up, but we ask everyone in the room, if possible, uh, to ask answer the last question we have uh, put in the polling that's uh, about how you evaluate your experience. And I'm going to share that. And uh, then we do the breakout uh, where people can reflect. And those who want to stay uh, don't have to go away. Uh, they can stay for the breakout. And also, we can do some Q&A uh, after that. So uh, this is the assessment that we are getting from participants uh, about usefulness, uh, the inspiration, uh, and learning of new things, uh, the connect, um, the fact that you connected with interesting people in the breakout sessions, the format, the, it's not yet over, there's still one more breakout after this. So, um, and uh, please uh, send your, your questions. As you can see, we are also getting questions from the participants and you can also visualize them from your mobile phone. Those were be discussed quickly after the breakout. So we are receiving your direct feedback. And uh, in the meantime, with the ones who want to stay, uh, be prepared. We'll do a next breakout. We'll be with groups of four. So during this breakout, you can reflect about what have been the insights, the, the main lessons learned, the ideas that uh, you would like to further discuss with the, our uh, panelists. So uh, we will give you a round of four or five minutes where in groups of four you can share uh, your main insights and ideas. Uh, and we keep the Q&A open and also the possibility to submit your uh, your uh, answers to the questions. So uh, those who want to stay, we can stay another 10 minutes. And uh, I, so I invite you to start the uh, breakout session. My colleague Rena and uh, Mende are supporting us in the technical side together with Jackson and Daria in the organization of the event. So join the breakout and be ready for some discussion about what you at some point we do have to uh, respect the timing we put and 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 close it uh, so we'll be happy to sort of be in touch with folks uh, I'll send a follow-up email from your access North America and we'll explore ideas about uh, sort of net small networking sessions that mimic this breakout room format and whatnot um, so I would encourage those that that are remaining and choose please do put your camera on um, we can have a more conversational format um, and then we'll, we'll cut this, this final part out of the, the recording that will go online in the future. But I just want to say thank you to the speakers uh, and, to, and to you, Paolo, um, in particular to, to Dr. Mary Cavanaugh. I think everyone set the tone here for a nice discussion. And then the, those of us in the breakout sessions were able to, to dig a little deeper as well. So um, yeah, th this will basically at this point um, imitate that, that dynamic of, of um, you know, small group chat. So please uh, engage. We're not quite we're not quite in person but we are face to face so i look forward to meeting some of the remaining participants daria please um you have yeah some nice i answers. also see the, the names of claire and lk they are also working for the eu projects as i guess uh, and uh, they're very active in uh, EU science diplomacy and disseminating the information trainings. So thank you for joining us, uh, especially for Elke and Claire. And uh, yes, if we have more questions, I, I mean, yeah, we have, if we have questions, perhaps we can take now. Yeah, these yes, are the um, questions can we that we- Yeah. Question? yeah. Yeah, pr Professor, I think, uh, actually, I think we have your question right here on the screen, but please, in your own words. Okay. Um, well, science diplomacy is not a new ph phenomenon. Um, 
has been going on for the last two decades, I would say. I participated in conference Vienna, um, even the Embassy of Japan in London organized a conference on science diplomacy. And lately we have seen many foreign offices, uh, many foreign affairs, appointing uh, supervisors, advisors, scientific advisors to the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And um, I have been dealing with diplomats for years, training, etc. In the past, we used to look at uh, science in terms of ethics, morality, religion, its impact on religion, etc. Uh, but lately, uh, science diplomacy and international policy. We organized a conference entitled Science Diplomacy and uh, International Policy with the participation of scientific attaches in London. There are about 54 groups uh, of scientific attaches. We have also medical attaches. We have building attaches. All come under the realm of uh, science. Building attaches, the main aim is to monitor all buildings, the impact of the environment uh, on all the buildings. So my question is, uh, as I said in the past, we used to say love levels or ranks. Today, the coronavirus levels or ranks, there is no difference. So my question is, uh, because of the coronavirus, uh, there is a move within governments uh, globally uh, from the wealth of nations to the health of nations. So, so health has become before wealth today. Obviously, uh, without wealth, without health, you cannot produce, generate wealth. So my question to the uh, uh, panelists, the speakers, uh, prestigious speakers, uh, very uh, insightful speakers, uh, whether they believe that we are moving now for a few months, for a couple of years, from the wealth of nations to the health of nations. Thank you. I can maybe comment a little bit on this. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, as an economist, you see, I really appreciate that you mentioned the wealth of nations, uh, which was written by uh, Adam Smith, a very famous, uh, he, he was Scottish, by, by the way. You're in Scotland, aren't you? Yes. So uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, we should move from the wealth of nations to the health of nations. But for this, we have to uh, uh, enhance or to push more. Uh, to push forward the idea that health is a public good you see if if we consider health human health as a public good it makes a big difference in uh, in developed countries health is more or less considered as a public good we have social protection we have uh, you know system that uh, prevent and get, that support human health but this is not the case at the world scale, you see. And uh, from moving from wealth of nations to the health of nations, we have to um, restart, to reimagine uh, the role of the WHO, for instance, which was very much criticized as a multilateralism uh, organization. So there is still room to, uh, to go, there's still way to go in order to, to, to have this idea as of the human health as public good, I would say global public good, but uh, I agree with you. This is um, the road that we have to uh, to go. We have another Thank question. You. We have another question. If you want to take it, with regard to the shift of focus and collaboration to COVID nineteen. Are any of the projects as for the 4 c inside looking at the impacts uh, to other research collaborations? And I, I, I wrote that question. I'd be happy to um, clarify if anything's unclear with what I wrote quickly online. 
piece? Uh, yeah, so I'm just, I'm interested. I think Mitchell spoke about kind of the, the shift of re research focus, and I know we're seeing that in national research efforts, but also in collaboration. So I'd be curious if the research efforts from inside and from S4D4C have actually empirically started looking at this, at what are the costs to uh, other international collaborations that are maybe being put on hold at the time, if you have a sense of, of what numbers of full-time employee research hours are being shifted toward these COVID collaborations as opposed to the previously ongoing collaborations. Um, For insight, I'll just mention that we've been able to preserve our original research program. <laughs> I think that uh, I think that that uh, what we're learning during during this uh, crisis is just how useful and interesting these uh, these online encounters are, and and the 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 real opening up of of networking possibilities, also um, through the fact that people are so interested in in you know learning more about what is what is going on you know how we can uh, as as the professors have said you know move toward this ideal of uh, the health of nations but i'll, I'll let uh, pierre bruno or or uh, uh deria reply uh on your substantive question okay, would you briefly introduce yourself uh to those of us remaining oh yes uh, yes, hi, I'm, I'm Maya Sahotilal. I'm a PhD student in Berlin, Germany. I'm doing meta research, so I'm studying how people do research, specifically in biomedical research. And before starting my PhD, I was working in a little bit of science policy, science diplomacy, but now I guess I'm just a scientist in diplomacy as an American in Germany. Uh, this is why I really like the sort of the very ends of the sessions where we get together, the conversation gets a little more, in, more intimate um, and sort of the value of what these small group um, breakout sessions can be. So I'd be really happy to sort of, yeah, work with some of the attendees who are still here to design follow-ups, understand what topics you're interested in so we can maybe create specific small groups. Uh, and then Claire, I would invite you to briefly introduce yourself as well, because I know you're speaking as a um, coordinator for, for um, inside. So your answer, uh, I mean, you're, Yes, I, I apologize. I, I didn't have the full gallery view on, so I thought that there were very few of us. Uh, good evening to everyone. Yes, I'm, I'm the executive director of the Inside Project. I happen to be a, a social psychologist, uh, uh, very interested in stakeholder engagement and in, in creating uh, ways of um, uh, interface between different disciplines and, and, and practices or practitioners. And I have the honor of working uh, with people like Pierre Bruno Ruffini, uh, many historians, uh, scholars of science, technology, and society, and so forth. And I, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to think that many of you will look at our inside website. Jackson already shared the, the link. And I'll just uh, put in a plug now for our, our next summer's edition of our summer school and, and uh, ask you to sign up for our newsletter, register for our newsletter to, to be informed about that and other invitations. Thanks, Jackson. And then if you allow me, I can uh, cut in and introduce myself uh, because also Daria kindly mentioned me. So I'm Elke, Elke Dahl. I coordinate the S4D4C project and also because Mitchell had to leave I can try to uh, answer the question uh, that was asked uh, because it's, it, I mean, the straightforward answer would be no, we did not look at that. We do not have this kind of quantitative data, Maya, that you would like to look at. You would probably like, have liked us to look at. Uh, we did actually shift some of our resources uh, at, in the S4D4C project. Um, where we kind of like remodeled one of the deliverables that we wanted to write uh, and actually made it a policy brief on COVID-19 uh, that we published in summer this year. Um, and that did not really deviate something from our resources a lot because we just wanted to make something that is policy relevant and this topic just was uh, very much at that point of time as well. Um, 
but and and then on a personal note i think some anecdotal evidence certainly uh, does see that that some resources have been uh, deviated and some stuff has been simply put on hold because people cannot visit their labs um so yeah of course uh, but no we don't have any data on on this and i do think from the european point of view um the build back better beyond gdp uh <laughs> and, and 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 that kind of discussion it does still go very much into the direction of addressing climate change so at least for that global challenge i think there is still an understanding that this has to be very much part of any covid recovery um discussion also in the research field. So we see a lot of uh, funds that are going to go into that direction and not uh, just into health, so to say. That would be it. Thanks, Jackson, and thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I don't, I would say, Pier Bruno, you have heard uh, a lot of uh, also uh, just uh, before we close, just one last, uh, last, uh, you know, uh, benedizione, as we say, you know, from you have been being a diplomat, having done it, uh, uh, having experienced, uh, having been in the diplomatic uh, experience, you know, what is your uh, closing, closing remarks? So I then pass the floor. I hope that's easy uh, to say. Uh gracias y temisa is that's not easy um <laughs> what what could i say well um you know scientists are have the reputation of being rather idealistic people uh diplomats are, are more realistic people realist people by construction and uh this is very challenging to have those two population mixing and nevertheless um, science diplomacy practices show that it is possible to draw the best of science, cooperation, spirit, sharing, and so, and the best of diplomacy together. That is dialogue, in the spirit of dialogue. So uh, that's what I could say in the ending. That science diplomacy is a wonderful um, area of um, policy uh, and also of reflection. Uh, a complicated one, but it's probably something quite worth to invest in, not only from an intellectual point of view, but for a very practical point of view. Because if I very often um, put light on the competitive aspect of science diplomacy, my feeling is that, of course, the cooperative aspects should be uh, the ones that could be, uh, that should be. Uh, and hence uh, supported as much as possible and once again from the best from coming from science and from the best coming from uh, diplomacy i'll briefly um just say my colleague i think will speak on behalf of your access north america but in my earlier introduction of you professor Rafini, i think i i must have been misreading something so just to clarify you were counselor for science and technology at the French embassies in Russia and Italy during your earlier career. That's I think correct. I may have uh, jumbled a few words. No, so just for context, no, I want to set correct. the record state. So thank, thank you so much for your remarks. Paolo, can you uh, introduce our colleague one last time for some closing remarks? Uh, you mean, sorry. Uh... No, I, I think uh, it's been really fun. With, again, with the small group that remains, uh, I'm really happy to, to follow up. We can have a email session going and we can create some some events um, based on your specific topics of interest. So Paolo, I'll invite you to maybe share some some closing thoughts from your part and then uh, I would love for, for Daria to, to wrap up for us. Thank you. I mean, it's daunting to talk about science diplomacy at this time and uh, it's such a complex and at the same time inspiring topic. Uh, it was a really uh, great uh, I couldn't keep up with a new question I wanted to ask. Uh, so uh, personally, I like very much uh, to uh, create, co-create 
science diplomacy by creating connections between the participants. And I feel that in this case, we also had this opportunity of meeting uh, among uh, uh, beautiful brains. So uh, I'm really grateful also to all the participants and for Jackson and Daria for inviting us. Uh, I also thank uh, the technical team that has been supporting the, the run up of the event. So Rena and uh, from Turkey, from Istanbul, and uh, we have another colleague, Mende, that's connecting from LA. And uh, really thank you everyone. I really wish uh, uh, everyone a good festivities for the coming uh, and happy new year. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Thank so you I, yeah, I mean, I know it's a bit longer than we, uh, you know, planned. Uh, and thank you very much for your time that you attended till the end of the um, event. Uh, I want to thank Rena, Paolo, Jackson, and Mente. I mean, we also worked as a team, but for me personally, it was not an easy uh, presentation. I can just say that because the, for the first time, we said something about your access and we tried to position it in science diplomacy. So, Claire, LK, you know, Rufin, uh, uh, Professor Rufin, they, you know that it's a bit difficult and tricky to talk about these, you know, general and first time things. So you helped me a lot, especially with your, you know, all your sources in your websites. Uh, so, and uh, I just want to wrap up by saying that we are planning to make a follow-up meeting for the uh, following year. So I think we would have a more and broader concept and we will be discuss dis uh, discussing, I hope, you know, the post really post pandemic era and how science diplomacy was discussed uh, in December, January. So uh, I also wish you happy holidays and health days. So hope to meet you in our future events. Thank you very much for your joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.